Welcome to She Prop Talk. Today's special episode is guest hosted by Renee from Pixie Bomber Cosplay. And today she's chatting with Leanna Cosplay in part one of two episodes about historical cosplay. I certainly learned a lot from these she proppers, so I want to thank Renee and Alicia for submitting this episode. Thank you so much for listening, and be sure to tune in again for part two featuring Brienne from Brienne Opal. If you happen to be interested in guest hosting your own podcast episode, I really want to hear from you. You can email me at shepropforum at gmail.com. And let me know that you're interested, and I'll get you the information that you need. All right. Thanks so much. Enjoy this episode. Welcome to Sheep Prop Talk. I am Renee, known as Pixie Bomber. Today's episode is on historical cosplay. This can look like an exact replica of a cosplay, or it can look like a specific time era taking the known character into consideration and designing them as that would fit into something that were the 60s or even the 1960s. The guest for this episode is Alicia, and joining us to listen is Brienne. Alicia, can you let the listeners know what is your favorite historical cosplay you have built? Oh, I think so far my favorite historical cosplay that I've built is actually my Victorian Lady Loki, which is the most recent. How long did that take you to build? Let's see. I think it took out a year and a half to build it. Does that include time for research as well? Um, yeah. Although I did a lot of the research before I even started building it. Is that n- normal for you to do when you are doing a historical costume is to research it heavily before you make it? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I usually do research beforehand. Um, at least try to glance over some of the what would be historically accurate, what wouldn't be um, good patterns to use and that kind of thing. As part of the research process, as well as the building process, can you let us know what are some of your favorite resources that you have found or used while building your multiple historical cosplays? Well, probably the best resource Pattern wise for anything before Victorian, I I found is period patterns and also Laughing Moon Mercantile. Then if you're going to include Victorian era, um, Reconstructing History is also a really good resource. Have you found any good resources for finding the fabrics or the trim or some of those finer details that may not be as widely known? Um, I probably don't get quite into the details of trims as I probably should. I tend to go with um, local fabric stores like Joann's. Um, When I was in Washington, Pacific Fabrics was a good resource for trims. I was trying to think where I've gone online for trims, but uh, actually some of the, the trim just looking at the the manufacturer of the trim on the spool at Joann's and going to their website. Um, I can't think of the name of it off the top of my head. So if we were to go back to um, the beginning of making garments, when it comes to the foundations of the garment, which ones are essential? Which ones did you find to be the most challenging and growing for you as a cosplayer? I think probably the corset layer is usually the most challenging, but it's you definitely want to have the proper, proper foundation garments. So corset, if there's a corset, um, if it includes a hoop skirt, make sure you've got the hoop skirt. Although sometimes it can be really hard to find those those uh, those particular foundation garments. But, but yeah, corsets have been in the most challenging. Um, doing a Regency corset, I'd been used to to putting in steel boning to support the the structure, whereas for a Regency, it was actually cording. So take a big needle and after making cording channels, like basically just pull the cording through the channel. Did you find one to be easier than the other? Um, I've actually found steel boning to be much easier than cording, but so I... 
I generally tend to prefer Victorian corsets as far as building goes. When I built my 17th century corset, I was low on money. And so I used industrial size zip ties in my corset. Have you used any unique uh, items to make your foundation garments? Um, I used a stick of wood for my <laughs> Regency um, for the, the center busk of the corset. I've also done uh, Japanese hakama and, and instead of having a little plastic tab that you put through the back of the, the OB to hold the back up, I actually used a uh, tongue depressor. Sometimes it's really helpful to be creative. That's awesome. <laughs> That's an amazingly creative solution. I'm here for it. Yeah. When you're adapting, uh, for example, with your Loki, you took the elements of Loki and you adapted it into a different time era. Which elements did you say this is essential versus this needs to be changed? And how did you make those decisions? Um, well, I knew the first element that was going to be essential is going to be the colors because Loki is known for green and gold and blue and a bit of black. So worked with those colors, figured out which one is the most used for Loki. Um, use that as the overall color. And then I looked at some of the trims I had and realized that, oh, this looks like this part of Loki's jacket from Avengers. So... I definitely should use that and it should be because it looks like the front of it. I should put it in the front. And then obviously horns, the, the horn crown is going to be very important. So I definitely made sure I made that. Um, Did you make the horn crown more specific to screen accuracy as opposed to historical <laughs> accuracy? Uh, it was, it was more, more for screen accuracy. Yeah, it was a horny crown. Um, <laughs> uh, no, um, I actually was looking more for screen accuracy for that one, just because there isn't really a good example of anything like that in Victorian era. So um, since I couldn't find an example, it's okay, well, we'll go the example I know, which is Loki from the MCU and the, the horns, I've seen this costume in person, and the Loki horns definitely are essential for that character. And I thought it was really well pulled off, uh, pulling it all together, where you can still see the historical element, but you also can know that's that's Loki based on that. Like, it definitely um, is not something to skip. Yeah. <laughs> the last question I have for myself is, can you briefly tell us about making a screen accurate cosplay that exists in a different era? Um, well, I think the, the one that I've done that's very screen accurate is actually I've done a Star Trek original series, actually two Star Trek original series uniforms, uh, one for my husband and one for myself. Um, in which era do those take place in? Um, those were from the 60s. So uh, I did some research into what are the foundation garments, you know, because I don't want I don't want the dress to look awkward because it's designed around specific kinds of undergarments. So I actually got the properly colored, proper material for the dress and for the shirt and knowing that there wasn't such a thing as uh, iron-in interfacing. I used hair cloth to interface the um, the collar to make it stiff. And the only thing I couldn't get accurate was the sparkle pants for my husband. And they are often referred to as the sparkle pants because it was black, but it had bits of uh, it looks like maybe copper, gold, metallic thread through it. That sounds awesome. I need to find that fabric for myself. I, I would love to find that fabric too. So I basically just found something that had a similar sheen that would look like how it looked on the screen because the cameras didn't pick up the uh, the metallic. 
So it sounds like you made an adaptation from what was er the original costuming to make it Mm -hmm. look representative in photos and in person. Is that correct? Right. Um, But that was more or less because I can't find that fabric. It just doesn't exist. Which I think often happens when you're trying to go um, back in time to a different era. Mm -hmm. Don't you have a second historical cosplay you made as well? As far as one that's accurate to a different time. Sorry, let me rephrase. Um, Don't you have another screen accurate cosplay that you made in addition to the Star Trek uniforms? Um, Yeah, I do have a fourth doctor. um, And that took actually a lot of pattern hacking. Some of the groups I'm a part of on Facebook, I was able to find out that, oh, it, the jacket is this specific color. It is this specific kind of corduroy. And I was lucky enough to find that exact color and type of corduroy at Joanne's. So, and then lots of people were saying, oh, well, the jacket has this key detail that you need to know about. There's like a pocket on one one sleeve that um, I had to try to figure out how to make. Was there anything else about that specific costume that um, challenged you as a cosplayer or that you just found to be um, easier based on screen references? I actually found the jacket to be the most, most challenging of the entire thing. Um, And so I had to use, I think four patterns and I still had to make some adaptations because of the way the pattern or way the jacket was constructed for the fourth doctor. When it comes to historical costuming, do you find that you need to take different patterns and put them together to make it look representative of what is supposed to be shown? Um, depending on what I'm looking to build, it can be that I have to use multiple patterns. Um, In the case of the fourth doctor, that was true. Um, Just because nobody makes the safari style jacket pattern at all. Um, When it comes to things like uh, my Victorian Loki, I could go almost completely with truly Victorian patterns because they had everything I I needed from the skin up for that one. I just want to jump in and co-sign Truly the Victorian real quick. It is an awesome resource. Big fan. Is there any other questions that you have for Alicia, Brianne? Not that I can. I didn't know that was part of it. Uh, No, it's fine. Um, Let me just re-question it. Uh, Brianne, do you have any questions for Alicia since you've been sitting on the podcast listening in? Yeah. um, I don't have specific questions for you so much as I really want to go through and look at pictures of ridiculous Victorian hats and see if I can find you a Loki analog. (laughs) That's all I want to do with my time right now. Awesome. That would be really awesome. I I know, right? Surely there has to be something. You would think with how ridiculous (laughs) the Victorian fashion was. Yes! They weren't symmetrical is the problem. The horns are pretty symmetrical. It'd be odd just to have like one horn sticking out of the hat. No, that would be a problem. But one I'd be willing to solve. Well, actually, the um, Marvel Comics... uh, uh, Lady Loki sometimes only has one horn and that's... the other one's broken. Oh, perfect. Oh my God, that's perfect. Oh, it would be a deep cut. I'd be here for it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Before we go, Alicia, how can the Shape Prop listeners find you on social media if they want to find your references and all your photos? Actually, I'm on Facebook at uh, Leanna Cosplay, and I'm also on Instagram, also at Leanna Cosplay, and I just started a TikTok account, so it doesn't have anything on it yet. Um, I am Brianne Opal on Instagram and Twitter. I have not yet succumbed to TikTok, 
but God, this, you know, who knows, who knows what the gratefulness of time will bring. And listeners, thank you for your time. Wait for episode two, where we will interview Brianne. Have a good day.